It would be a, a crying shame if you spent five hours reading memes about a Chinese spy balloon and couldn't focus on dinner with your children. Hello and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. Nathan, I'm going to mention a phenomenon that happens more and more these days. I became aware of a news item, not by seeing a headline directly, but by seeing a series of jokes on social media. Interesting. Yeah. So all these jokes revolved around balloons. Balloon yeah. joke after balloon joke, jokes about shooting balloons down, jokes about what Americans looked like, the view from American from the balloon of Americans in their yard with beer cans scattered everywhere and shotguns in their hands. And pretty soon I put two and two together and realized, okay, we're dealing with a Chinese spy balloon based on all of the, the different ways in which this was described. And yeah, well, so what is. you're saying is interesting because you, you became aware of something through memes, puns, uh, jokes and whatever before you were actually mm -hmm. aware of the actual event. So it, it came to you backwards. In some yeah, sense. and it's kind of, of a, well, I mean, it's of a piece of, you know, several years ago, people started getting their news from satirical shows like The Daily Show or <laughs> satirical sites like The Onion. Now we're well, a step the Babylon down. B, the Babylon B is definitely in the running Babylon still. Babylon B is definitely in there. But now we're a step down and these are just, you know, regular Joes like you and I posting statuses. None of them very funny, by the way. Sorry, guys. No, most of these jokes were dead on arrival, in my opinion. I thought, okay, enough. I, I resisted the urge. Well, now I'm not resisting. Now I'm saying it on the air on, on my podcast. But I resisted the urge to say, to put, post something snarky about, okay, enough of the balloon jokes. They're not funny. But I'm going to say it now. They're not funny. Enough of the balloon jokes. <laughs> The, the, uh, the Babylon Bee did have an article talking about um, China sh sending a warship toward the U.S., but saying it was for meteor meteorological purposes only. So, Right, you know. and on that note, it's a good, It's in case some of you missed this, somehow didn't notice it, Nathan, can you give us just a quick recap of the basic yeah. plot of what so, we're talking about here? So, so there was a balloon, a surveillance balloon from China that um, the Pentagon... So the military had picked it up on January 28th as it was coming over the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and then tracked it across Alaska and Canada. But then it entered into U.S. airspace again over Montana, over what the Pentagon would call, quote, sensitive sites. Um, and I guess Montana <laughs> is a pretty... Uh, Euphemisms, key, yeah. Yeah, pretty key player in a lot of our nuclear missile capabilities and um, military infrastructure. and. Nobody knew about it, but then it was spotted from a commercial aircraft. So once civilians saw it, then everybody's like, hey, what's this? What's going on? And there was a bit of an uproar. And then they say, yeah, this is what it is. And then China says, yeah, it's ours, but it's for meteorology. And everybody <laughs> believed that not at all. Um, and then it seems like there was a couple days there where it was like, what's going on? There's a balloon that's taking who knows what floating over the U.S. And then, of course, you have... Um, some people say it's a violation of national sovereignty. This is, shows a weakness in the U.S. military. Why don't we just shoot it down? And then the Biden administration saying, well, we don't want to you know, shoot it down over an area where it could cause damage when it falls. So finally, it kind of floats out over the Carolinas. Um, and this thing is being um, escorted by fighter jets, which I think the asymmetry of technology here is part of the hilarity of it. So, you know, it gets out and... I forget is North or South Carolina puts out a statement telling people not to shoot at it um, because their rifles won't reach it. It's at close to 60,000 feet and your bullets will come back down. So I just love the fact that that was part of like public service about the spy balloon is don't take matters into your own hands with your deer rifle anyway. So it gets out over the Atlantic ocean and then an F 22 takes it out with a sidewinder missile or whatever it is which seems like a little bit of overkill when really all we need is like some action figure with a safety pin to get this thing. But, um, so they're now collecting debris out of the ocean from a missile hitting a balloon, <laughs> which oh it, I mean, and you, I mean, you can see the, the footage of it is online. So, um, the, the missile wins, but that, that basically, that's a very short version of the story. And it's also noteworthy 
that I have not seen any news organizations, and this is across the political spectrum, all of them refer to it as a spy balloon. The Pentagon says it is. They don't know exactly what type of stuff it's been broadcasting, communicating, or how it's working. Um, it's not using radar, or that would have been more detectable. And China does claim it's their balloon, just not that it's a spy balloon. So <laughs> I haven't seen any place, any, I haven't seen anything anywhere where anybody other than the Chinese thinks that it wasn't a surveillance balloon. And in fact, the Pentagon says China has surveillance balloons over Europe, Asia. There's one going over Latin America right now. Three came through during the Trump administration and one previously in the Biden administration. So you can't really link it necessarily to, you know, who the president being means that the military is doing sure. a better or worse job or anything like that. Um, it's just that China's being China and the U S puts massive amounts of money into inflatable surveillance technology and does the same thing probably all over the world. So it's, there's, there's that at play there. It's just, I don't know what makes it funny about living in the 21st century. And we're talking about shooting balloons with fighter jets. Um, Oh man. Well, there you have it. What's what sounds funny is no the the, the this balloon was deployed for meteorolo meteorological purposes. <laughs> it happens to be floating over Montana <laughs> in some you know quote sensitive sites. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to be a trigger happy conspiracy theorist to say, "Hey, wait a second. You know what we have in Montana?" <laughs> so, I that whole part well, The Chinese just really me. wanted some great photos of cows. I think that's what it was, Cameron. Clearly, yeah. yes. Breathtaking views in, in Montana, <laughs> Montana, of course, as well. And that, yeah, an, an F-22 taking out the balloon. There are so many features of this story that, sorry, they do just, they're, they're, I'm, they're funny to me. So, so <laughs> I, well, might, I might be chuckling yeah. a bit. So balloons are used for meteorology heavily. So there is such a thing as meteorological balloons. So oh, of course, we don't, yeah. we're, not, we're not mocking that. Um, and even like our local middle school launched a balloon to take like, you know, data on its trip and see how far it was go. So balloons are a part of the, the 21st century for sure. I think it's really funny on one hand. On the other hand, it's had significant implications on the U.S.-China relationships and which diplomats are canceling yes. which trips and some of that that might not be funny in the future, but for now we can giggle about it. Right. And I mean, the other element here is, as you were mentioning to me, Nathan, as I was talking to you about it, Everybody has a fully formed, well, many people have a fully formed opinion on all all of this right now and, and theories that are refined and prepared when, in fact, we, I mean, we still, we don't know very much. I mentioned to you, obviously, this thing had some detailed surveillance on it. And you said, well, we don't really know any of that. <laughs> well, there, yeah, there it's are, currently scattered details. in the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, yes. And so we, again... A theme we we visit often on this show is the way in which, in a media saturated landscape, news arrives, and then public opinion swells very very quickly, and we start to try to go to work on conclusions immediately before we have the full story, before we have all the evidence, and also there are I mean again we're not experts on this form of technology, we don't know all of the details of the story, so. We're not, in many cases, on many news items, we're not even really competent to make serious comments on it. Not that we aren't allowed to or don't have the right to, but, you know, we're not really competent to, to comment with any real expertise on the matter. So confusion just kind of multiplies. Yeah, so is, well, all right, well, this, this is, look, try this one for size. So you saw most of the references to this as jokes, which would mean that the format in which you saw it, the purpose of that format was not to be helpful or to contribute to a conversation. It was for entertainment Correct. and amusement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that is the, if that's what, like, are we, are we the type of people who are kind of dredging the lake of reality for useful content and ways for us to be helpful in real world problems? Or are we just kind of skipping along the surface looking for uh, fun and interesting things to populate our news feeds with the, I, I guess, you know, cause we've asked that question, like, why do we read the news or what is your motivation for doing this? Or, um, yeah, those are questions in my mind. Like, okay. Yeah. And I think well, answer that. And then I have another one for you. Well, yeah. I mean, just a, another comment there. I think 
the 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 basic writings of I mean, if you think about what Neil Postman had said so long ago in Amusing Ourselves to Death, and then he added and refined some of those things themes in Technopoly later on. But Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death still remains a standard, really helpful text on the way news mutated into a, has mutated into a form of entertainment for so many of us. And that part of this is just the way all of our media works. In particular, it's conditioned. It conditions us to not take seriously what we're seeing. So the classic example that he gives, and this is, of course, the television era. We're now in the we're, we're, we're well past the television era in which Neil Postman was writing. But he would said, let's let's say you have a report on a tragic plane crash of a commercial airliner. Terrible story. And then it's interrupted by a commercial break where for orange juice and it's so disorienting and it's impossible that that little interruption doesn't in some in very important but subtle ways undermine the seriousness and the gravity of the story and not to mention you have a surfeit of information on a screen too he talked about the ribbons with Mm -hmm. you know or the tickers rather that, that just have constant you know information overload as the story is unfolding then there's more information then there's there are all sorts of data points on the on the screen itself so that you can't actually process properly any of what you're getting and yeah and then add to that you know sort of satirical news sites which have been a thing for a long time of course and now our our ability to just comment without restraint yeah you have a perfect environment for dredging the news not to contribute necessarily to the conversation, but also just to use it as a, a kind of prop or an accessory. Do you think there's um okay, I, I'm fully on board with with all of that. The news is entertainment. Is there a sense in which sometimes we try to make like we try or could there be another side where we're trying to like connect ourselves to it in a way that like there there are news items that happen that in the instant, there's literally nothing we could do about it. Like you can't shoot down yes. a Chinese spy balloon with your deer rifle. Um, so there's, I mean, okay, another example. Right now, we're just seeing information come in on the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Catastrophic. Yeah. Oh man, that is. I mean, the death toll has increased like 600 people just in the time since we started talking. Um, That is wild. You look at the videos of that. And now, will there be aid necessary? Will people need to? Yes, absolutely. But in the moment Mm -hmm. that you're learning about it, there is absolutely nothing that you can do. Um, You can, uh, I don't know. I mean, outside of the spiritual realm and the ability, you know. Beyond praying. And and praying for the hurt and praying for the people who are helping. um, And people mock that. But compared to what? Right. I mean, so 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 much of what's happening in the news, you have no control over. That is, I guess, are there times in which we make we? It's one of those, you know, you hear the phrase, you either laugh or cry. Um, mm-hmm. Is it that we're choosing to laugh because that's about the only thing we can do? I actually think that's an important question and offers a better, maybe a more redemptive take than the one that I've just given. So I'm talking about humor as sort of a picture of the decline of, of public discourse, but it doesn't need to, so we've talked about the transcendent aspects of humor as well. So this might be stretching things a bit, but you're right. Many of the news items that, that we see paint a picture of our own powerlessness for us in the sense that there mm-hmm. is, there's nothing we can do about what we're hearing about. However, unless you have an F22. Unless you have an F22 there, yes. But you if you can make if you can joke about it, you are in a sense transcending those circumstances. If you can make Now there there are there are various I mean there are forms of humor that are more scornful than others. Mm-hmm. There are forms of humor actually that can be more redemptive and lighthearted and that have built into them a kind of resilience in the face of opposition. And I mean, there are many traditions of talk about a way to kill humor by analyzing it, but you know, there are many rich traditions of, of joke. Think about some of the Jewish humor 
much of it born of incredible suffering and persecution and opposition. And yet it, it's tremendously funny. A lot of it is predicated on tragedy, but there's this kind of stubborn resilience built, built into it as well. So there is, there are, there are those signals of the transcendent mm-hmm. to use Peter Berger's phrase, aspects of humor. And that, that can play a part here too. But I think another issue that you're pointing to Nathan is When it comes to the powerlessness, the powerlessness often has to do with the distance, the distance between us and the event. So if if we lived in this region of Turkey and we survived, there would be some very tangible contributions we could make. Right. Mm -hmm. And so often news is about distant events. And I think part of what we we try to hammer home often on this podcast is to be more involved in your neighborhood, be more involved in your community, be more involved where you are. And there are news items, of course, (laughs) where you are. And those are the places where you actually are not entirely powerless in the sense that there are things you can do. There are ways you Mm -hmm. can help. And so probably a needed shift for many of us. And of course, we're not saying stop reading international news but maybe to try to put more of an emphasis on being involved where you are as well paying attention to what's going on yeah watching so is the there, local news more reading the local news more yeah. <laughs> is there both and there because i'm sure samaritan's purse is already mobilizing people um or right. other yes. christian aid organizations are, are are geared up for it so um there are ways in which we can we can support and, and help with the after effect of it. But we're just talking about the helplessness in the exact moment of it. Um, that, yeah. I, you know, when you're talking about the humor transcending, so I was reading an account of um, <clears> the <throat> 101st Airborne Division jumping into Normandy and the plane full of guys, they're taking on flak, like they're being shot and you're in a plane. So it's not like you can move and get out of the way. Like you have nowhere to go. Um, and they're getting ready to jump into enemy fire. And it just, the, the person who's telling the story based off the eyewitness accounts paints a beautiful picture of just the tension of just sitting there in the plane or standing there in a the plane, waiting for the light to go green while people are getting shot in the plane that's going to actually end up crashing. But in the, in the midst of that, what everybody remembers is there's this one guy from West Virginia who you kind of have to just imagine the dark, the gunfire, everybody's thinking they're die. And just the silence who then this guy goes, Hey, does anybody want to buy a good watch? And the whole plane just erupts in laughter and the light goes green and they <laughs> jump out. Um, and everybody remembers that of like this tension breaking, ridiculous statement that in some ways, does anybody want to buy a good watch right before you jump in to Normandy? Um, mm-hmm. Highlights the hopelessness of like the inability that you have to do anything else. Um, yeah. Is there, does, I think that fits with what you were saying. Oh yeah. That not, and that's profound. And again, if you can, those sorts of gestures, which are, again, let's use Peter Berger's phrase, prototypical human gestures. That is just very characteristic of human beings are actually pretty amazing things to be able to do, especially in moments like that, that are as charged like that. So some element of that is 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 certainly probably playing a part here but i think you just the ways in which something instantly a news item catches the public imagination and then morphs into a meme or a, an incessant joke and everybody wants to get in on the joke everybody wants to have their own little say that is not always that helpful. <laughs> no, and, and there's not, like, I can't for the life of me think of anything remotely funny about an earthquake in Syria and Turkey. Oh, of course not, no. Like, and I'm that, sure and, people say something snarky about corruption or leaders or something, but it's going to fall flat. Like, there's there's no joke. No, the only, no, I don't think any, the only humor that could, that happens around something like that would be sort of the the kind of, they're not laugh out loud jokes, the kind of very grim statements about man's total helplessness in the face of natural forces, mm-hmm. like shifting tectonic plates. And okay. Because there, there are some, there's some humor about, about the smallness of man in terms of, you know, 
massive like, tsunamis, earthquakes, floods. So you're, you're using humor there in a very interesting way because I wanted to link this to what you were saying about using humor to kind of transcend or or point out that we're, we're sort of helpless in it. And so do you want to mm -hmm. buy a watch is one of those moments. Is mm -hmm. there, and, and you've talked about being involved in your local community and looking like locally and we can support people who are going to help. And that and all that's all post hoc. That's all after the event. I think there are preventative things we can do on the home front. But is there so in the same way that a humorous con comment breaks the tension and highlights the absurdity of what we can actually control, is there value, or let's just say as Christians, to to publicly speak the reality of the things that we aren't in control of in a culture that loves to be in control of everything. Like, is there a, a ministry of <laughs> reality, so to speak of all you can do about that is be sad. And that's okay because you're, you are human. Uh, like I, I'm, yes. I'm playing with an idea that, you know, Wendell Berry talks about the need to be whole is only achievable when you desire to be only human. Mm -hmm. And so there's, we can undershoot yeah. it in an animal sense, or we can overshoot it in a divine sense, but satisfaction for humanity comes when we embrace the goal of being human, not something else. And so is there a sense in which yeah. Christians should be able to be helpful in some sense by saying, by highlighting what it is that we can't do? I think so. Sounds counterintuitive. I mean, well, how are these for some grim jokes? I mean, you could make some... Some of the, the the types of jokes that would that would arise in a situation as catastrophic and tragic would be, well, if only of those buildings had built had been built better or better up to code, or maybe if people mm -hmm. had checked their weather apps or something like that, because anything like that would just highlight the utter insufficiency of human means of control in the face of something this powerful and this massive. And it would, and so some of those jokes can now they run the risk of total of complete insensitivity. So you want you want some distance, and you want to be very careful. But what what can be helpful in some of that kind of more grim type of humor is that it, in the best of circumstances, it highlights our it helps us puncture holes in our illusions of power and control. Mm. And as modern people we really do have aspirations to control everything, including our environment. And we think we have that control. So, okay. But that, that that's exactly the reason why a Chinese balloon mm -hmm. is such is perceived as such a threat. Right. Yeah. Cause you don't have power. So over is it. there right. And so it's in your space. Kind of is there a prophetic ministry for Christians to, to highlight human powerlessness? Yes, I think there is. And, I think it's it's going to be a thankless job. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants but to be that gotta, guy? But somebody's got to do it. Well, it's really interesting though, Nathan. I think we've we've talked about this before on the podcast, and this is probably a, a subject for another whole episode at some point. But years ago, you and I were talking a lot about the ways in which the so-called problem of evil is phrased in the West. And in the West, it's, you know, we, we've declared it a problem, which, by the way, I automatic, I object to the terminology. I don't think it's a problem. You have a problem with I the problem. I think it's a mystery. Got it. Right? I have a problem with the problem. <laughs> I don't think we, I don't think this is a, this is solvable in, ter in the same terms that a mathematical equation is. I think there are, there are some answers that we can, that we can have this side of eternity. But also, the kind of question that often arises is, you know, how could this happen? How could this happen? How could a good God allow this to happen? Now, I want to tread carefully here, but that's you and I in particular have often said that seems to be a uniquely modern question. And I've we've done some digging and some people told us off and said, no, it's not. This is a classic philosophical question. In fact, it is not. It is a uniquely modern question, because first of all, let's just there's a powerful presumption built into it. And a lot of us, especially in apologetic circles, don't recognize this. If you say you know, we need an answer for this. How could God allow this? Apparently, we not a lot of apologists are reading the book of Job. They're presuming <laughs> that if an answer is forthcoming, a full comprehensive answer, we would be we would be up to the task and up to the challenge of understanding it. 
<laughs> well, so any time that one of my seem to be that we wouldn't. Yeah, one you know, as soon as so you think about answering theological questions of children. Um so the ones, let's see, the ones I've gotten this week is can God duplicate himself? Clearly coming from mm. somebody who's been reading too much Calvin and Hobbes. Answer that one is easy. Um <laughs> if you're omnipresent, fire, you don't need to be, yeah, you don't need to try. <laughs> yeah. Um more fascinating one. One of the little fellows the other night asked if Mary was guaranteed salvation by birthing the Messiah. Hmm. So could could Mary have been an apostate? Um mm-hmm. that one that one actually has some that's that's a fun rabbit trail to go oh, down. That's, but that's got some teeth. Yeah. <laughs> that's got some teeth. That that one I got it. Yeah. Um, but anytime that so, you know, these are the things we handled before bedtime. But the anytime that a kid asks me, why would God doesn't matter what the rest of the sentence is. As soon as I hear that terminology, why would God? I'm already like, I'm a professional yeah. on this. But that, that when you come into the question yeah. from that angle, red flags should be going up for you. Um, not red flags. It's just it's 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 the it's the Chinese balloon in your airspace because it immediately is coming in at a category and a level that there's a high degree of probability that there's not going to be a satisfactory. Now, sometimes there are. We know a lot about the character and the nature of God is revealed in the person of Jesus, and so we do have resources. I'm not throwing everything out here. I'm just saying that particular line of questioning is gets dicey based off of not the question, but the degree to which we expect or almost demand there to be an answer. Yeah, and yeah, that, so why would God... Maybe your counter is where were you? <laughs> borrow, <laughs> borrow Job, Job terminology there, but but also well, one, and another interesting item of note is as we were pursuing this, and I was in in the East, and most Eastern nations, it's relative. People don't generally now. This might this this changes, of course, with globalization and and American and Western influence. But generally speaking, people don't ask. When a natural disaster happens, how could this happen? It is assumed that this is part of life, that the world is filled with pain and suffering. It's punctuated by or there's a divine punishment. That we couldn't have anticipated. Or that or the causation yes, is really or simple. Or there's divine yeah, it's divine retribution. But yeah, the, the whole how could, you know, the the you know, the one in charge of the entire universe owes me an explanation for this doesn't occur it, it occurs to a certain kind of person mindset it's well, okay. that, it, that question arises in a certain cultural condition yeah yeah but the cultural condition i think is this which is that you only run into this problem if you believe that god is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and steadfast because if you think that Very god true. strikes the evil and an earthquake happens or whatever there's no existential crisis for you there you're like hmm wonder what they did and that's exactly what the book of job i think it's pretty important that we recognize it's one of the earliest old testament writings right is to yep. just skewer that concept right out of the gate the bible doesn't allow you to go there and say this person suffered therefore they were evil so the question of why would god allow only arises in a context where you believe that God is good and gracious and compassionate and forgiving and steadfast and his mercies are new every morning. So the problem doesn't come with the punishment. The problem comes with the goodness of God and us not knowing Mm -hmm. how to reconcile our tiny little view of the belief in the goodness of God and the badness that we see happen in our lives and the world around us. And so that's kind of a crazy thought to think that it's the goodness of God that creates the problem, not the badness Mm -hmm. of the world. No, and that's an absolutely essential observation here. And so highlighting human human powerlessness is a necessary thing because we are finite creatures in a fallen world. And no matter how many times that I, I say that, I find that the, the full reality of that just doesn't sink in for many of us. There were ages past where it did, where that there were ages past where the gospel seemed the gospel of Jesus Christ seemed too good to be true, and it was regre- it was rejected on that basis by many people. It's hard to believe now, but in our own time, and I'm borrowing this thought from Peter Kraft, the gospel is rejected as not being often. It's not seen as good enough, 
And that's because we're, <laughs> we're in a time where we, we experience so, so much luxury and so much the illusion of so much stability and control and comfort that we don't recognize our total need to be saved. But then something like this happens and there's massive cognitive dissonance because it messes with our entire sense of order that we have in our heads. But it's, a, it's an illusory sense of order if it's predicated on human control and manipulation, as it often is. And so I think we do have, there is a prophetic ministry of speaking to human powerlessness, not to, not to, not to put people down, not to discourage, certainly, but to, to bring about the proper perspective so that we're not brought to a point of despair by cataclysmic things that happen yeah. this side of eternity, which, which do all the time. Let me, let me tell a really weird story to try to pull in some, some thoughts here. So I worked at a science camp when I was in high school with, um, and one of the guys there. So some of you will be familiar with the American gypsy moth. It's the pest that destroyed, um, the American chestnut and is still a significant pest of a lot of the deciduous forest of at least the East coast. I don't know what it's like in out West. Um, and so it's, it's a big deal. It was released actually in Medford, Massachusetts, I think back in the late 1800s in an experiment of trying to like breed a better silk moth or something. So there you go for invasive species. Also, I don't know what the new name is, but it did officially get its scientific name changed in the last year or two because gypsy was seen to be a derogatory term, but that was only officially and nobody's actually changed the way they refer to it. But anyway, so I was working at the science camp and one of the other guys there, his job was to uh, reduce the population of gypsy moths. And so the way they did this was they had a biodegradable plastic that had the pheromone of a female gypsy moth on it. And they would distrib distribute these in the woods. And what would happen is the moth would think that the piece of pl biodegradable plastic that smelled like a female moth was a female moth and would spend all of its time and energy mating with the piece of plastic instead of mating with an actual gypsy moth. And so this was population control by faking out the attention effectively of the male gypsy moth. And so it's a weird tactic, but I, I think, so there, you don't want to be the person who says, oh, bad things happen and you can't do anything about it. Unless you're saying, let's radically narrow down, like what is a distraction? Like what is the, this analogy is getting weird, but what's the, the, the equivalent of like the thing that entices you that isn't productive for you to pursue when there are actually productive things you could be pursuing. And so it's not just enough to say, oh, don't worry about that or don't look at that. What we're actually saying is don't do that to the degree that you're distracted from the thing that you're actually being called to do where you are. And so don't let, don't let a false sense of like, I'm in charge of that be a decoy from you being unfaithful to the things you actually are in charge of. And so it would be a, a crying shame if you spent five hours reading memes about a Chinese spy balloon and couldn't focus on dinner with your children. Right? So, so part like, is a Chinese spy balloon a big deal? It is. But what do you like? Where is your focus and energy best mm -hmm. Spent And so what we're really calling for here, be it humor or otherwise, is I like a good joke as much as anybody else. But I think what I'm being convicted about as we speak about this is a radical reorientation of my focus on probably why Paul said set your mind on things above where Christ is seated, right? Right. Um, and then look for, okay, what is my response out of that reality? Not that I don't notice these things, but um, not that they don't become a distraction to me. Well said. And I think that's a fitting point of closure. So yeah, we, again, thank you for sticking with us. If you made some jokes, if you made some balloon jokes, it's okay. Nobody's looking down on you here. Just, they might come back. We might even make balloon jokes in the future. We don't know. We can't promise anything. Right. We might make some balloon jokes in the future too. You never know. But thank you for listening in. Thank you for your patience. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, 
whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.